on a night with a flash flood warning, and knowing pastors out of town, it would be really easy, I don't say right, to have stayed home tonight. So I'm so glad you didn't. You've, you've encouraged me to see so many of you here on a, such a bad weather kind of evening. So I thank God for that. Uh, let's go ahead and start with prayer. Father in heaven, what an encouragement it is to be with your people and to be here to worship you. Lord, uh, there's a, a million other places we probably could be tonight, but this is right where we want to be because of you. Not because there's anything great about us, but because of you. You make this a great place. And uh, Lord, I just pray that the, uh, the anticipation in our hearts as we gather around your word would be more than, more than met, Lord, that you would exceed our expectations in what you're going to do tonight, Lord. It's all got to be you. Yours is the power. Yours is all the power so that yours will be all the glory. And so put your power on display tonight, God. Use it in exactly the way that each of us needs. So amazing how you know every need perfectly in this room. And use your word in our lives for your glory. And uh, Lord, just bless the worship. Even as we close in song, bless our prayers. That all of it would be edifying. And that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that it would grip their heart. And that they would desire to be a part of your people. And even more importantly, desire to have a relationship with you. I ask it in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Most great stories, whether they be in the form of a book or a movie or any way that a story can be told, most great stories are like an emotional roller coaster. They take you up and down as you flip through the pages or watch through the scenes. And at one point, you can't wait for the end to come. When the tension has just been built up and built up and you're in the middle of the big part of the problem, you long for that resolution. You want to know how it's going to end. But then there's other times when you're so caught up in the world of the story, so caught up in the characters and the dialogue, you almost don't want it to end. You wish that there could be more chapters at the end. You wish it could be another half hour at the end of the movie. And I thought about the fact that our lives are a lot like that. There's times in our lives where we can't wait, and I don't want to say the end in the sense we can't wait to die, but hopefully as Christians we can't wait for the return of our Savior, which is how we want our lives on this earth to end. And then we go to the new earth. Then he will create the new earth. Sometimes the tension in our lives is so great that we, if we could, we want him to come right then, right there. But then there's other times where we can get so caught up in what really is still a wonderful world that God has made and enjoy the good things that he has put here so much that we don't want it to end. We don't want him to come back. Maybe we wouldn't say that, but we don't think about it very often. We don't think about his return because we can get so comfortable where we are. And in the case of a fictional story, when you get caught up like that, it's, it's not really a big deal. You're in for a minor disappointment when that story ends. But in the case of real lives, that is a big deal. It actually is dangerous. In the case of when we get so comfortable, if anyone gets so comfortable that they are not anticipating the coming of their Savior, not preparing for the coming of the Savior, it's dangerous. It leads to a wasted life in the li in the, when you consider the life of a believer. And for an unbeliever, this disregard, this lack of thought for the coming of Christ it's dangerous to your very soul. 
And we're going to see that in Matthew chapter 25 tonight. Will you turn there, please? Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. We'll be studying from 1 all the way to verse 13. It's really not that far. It's one, it's one parable. But we won't read through it at the beginning and then work through it later. We'll just work our way through it one verse at a time or a couple verses at a time. So we'll start with just reading Matthew 25, verse 1. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now what we just read is the start of a parable, obviously. And what Jesus does in this parable, like he so often does, is he uses what would have been a very normal situation, a very common, understood thing in their life, the life of those who were listening to him originally, in order to teach a profound spiritual truth. And the normal event that he's using here is that of a Jewish wedding, or more specifically, a Jewish wedding reception. Because what the norm was in this day was for what we would call the marriage ceremony to be held at the house of the father of the bride. So the bride's house where she had grown up, where she was probably still living at the time in that culture, that's where the ceremony would be. And then afterwards, the groom and his bride would travel the distance to his home. And the wedding reception would be at the groom's home. And along the way, they would very often be accompanied by a procession of people, very much like a modern-day bridal party. And so these virgins, as they're described in in verse 1 here, are very similar to what we would today call bridesmaids. These were like the bridesmaids, and they had a very specific job. Their job was to light the way from what was evidently an evening wedding ceremony to, from there, to the house of the groom. They were going to meet the groom along the way and light the way and accompany him and the bride to the reception. That is, in all likelihood, what is being envisioned in this parable. And so, getting to the, the uh, virgins or bridesmaids, I'll probably use those words interchangeably throughout the sermon. You'll know what I'm talking about if I say either one. There's ten of them we see in verse 1, and there doesn't seem to be any difference between them yet. They all go out. They've all got their lamps ready. Everyone seems prepared. But let's look at verse 2 because we're going to see there is a difference between some of these and the others. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. So what appears to be ten prepared bridesmaids going out to meet the groom in verse 1, we quickly see there's a difference in the, the character of these girls themselves. Five are wise and five are foolish. And that difference in who they are manifests itself in either a readiness or a lack of preparation. The wise ones are ready to receive the groom no matter what time of night he comes. The foolish ones are only prepared for a timely arrival. That's the differences we have so far in this parable. And you can just imagine the scene as they get there to the place where they were to meet the groom. You can imagine the excitement. You can imagine it growing as the hour at which he was to meet them approached. And then you can imagine probably that excitement slowly fading as the hours continued to go by and the groom doesn't show up. You all know that feeling when you're excited to meet someone And they never show. And slowly it turns into anxiety. And then all the questions start filling your mind of why and when. 
And eventually, their exhaustion overcomes any excitement that they had left because they all fall asleep. But then, let's finish this story. Verse 6, at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now I have to confess to you, when I first read this, and part of the reason why I chose to preach on this parable is that my first response was, what a strange story. Five or ten bridesmaids and one delayed groom. Ten bridesmaids, one delayed groom whose delay manifests the difference within these bridesmaids. Whose delay puts on display that five of them are wise and therefore ready and the other five are foolish and not ready when he appears. And those who are wise and ready, they go in with him to the marriage feast and those who are foolish and unprepared are left outside, hungry, cold, in the dark. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. That's intriguing, isn't it? The kingdom of heaven will be like this story. And I want to share with you four ways in which the kingdom of heaven will be like this parable. And the first is very simple. It's that the bridegroom has been delayed. The bridegroom has been delayed, putting it in our terms in Jesus' terms, he was warning them from his perspective that the bridegroom was going to be delayed a little bit. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. And he was warning them that it was going to be different than they expected. If they expected him to come during their lifetime, and that wasn't a wrong expectation by any means because he didn't tell them when, yet he wanted them not to be frightened or afraid when his coming took longer than they wanted it to, longer than they thought it might have. And from our, ex, from our viewpoint, we can say this parable is teaching us what is happening, why for 2,000 years we have looked for the coming of Jesus Christ and he has not yet come. This explains it. He says the bridegroom is going to be delayed a little bit. The bridegroom is going to be delayed. And while that delay is difficult for the wise virgins in the story, they have to wait patiently. Yet it represents an opportunity for mercy, doesn't it? Even in this story, what an opportunity they had as the, the foolish bridesmaids, as their oil burned low, to go quickly and grab more before the groom arrived. But I wonder, I know this is speculation, I know this is not a real story, we're speculating into a fake story, but I wonder if the thought process behind it is something like this. Well, if he hasn't showed up yet, and he's already so late, what are the odds he's coming tonight? Surely he's coming tomorrow. Surely there's been something that's kept him overnight. When instead, they should have thought like this. If he still hasn't arrived yet, that only makes it more likely he will be here any minute. Because he said he's coming tonight. And I think many people, they think along those lines. They think in terms of 
Well, for 2,000 years, they've been saying that he's going to come. How many lifetimes have come and gone? Surely it won't be in my lifetime. Surely it won't be right now. Surely it couldn't be this year. And they, I'm talking now not about believers. I'm talking about those who hear about the second coming and push it off. They comfort themselves with that idea. When instead, how they should be thinking is, if for 2,000 years he has not yet shown up, that only makes it more likely he could be here at any moment. So the bridegroom has been delayed. But the second thing we see here is that although he's delayed, he's coming and he's coming unexpectedly. And that's not only the purpose of this parable, but this whole section that the parable falls in repeats that message over and over and over. Let's just look at the highlights. We're not going to read the whole section. I'm going to read you a few verses out of it. Verse 36, you can just jump along with me. Verse 36 of chapter 24. It says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Now look at 42. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Look at verse 44. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Look at verse 50 in the parable that precedes this one. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect. And then look to the end of our passage once again, verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, I don't pretend to have a perfect understanding of the end times. I don't think anybody does have a perfect understanding of the end times. Isn't that what Jesus said there? No one knows it all. No one knows the day or the hour. But what I can say confidently based on this passage is this. Jesus Christ will come again, and he could come at any moment. His return is imminent. He could come tonight. And so any view that takes the stand of this X, Y, and Z must come to pass before our Savior returns for us, I don't see how it fits with those verses I just read you. But what I do see is many people using it as a false comfort. I'm not talking once again about Christians who are walking with the Lord here. I'm talking about those who are hiding from the Lord. And say, well, I know this, this, and this are going to take place before Jesus returns. And they comfort themselves with that idea. But any comfort that's gotten from that, from the idea that his return couldn't be any moment, it's a delusional comfort. It's the bliss of ignorance. He's coming. He's coming unexpectedly. And third, when he does, when he does, of all of those people, who think that they know him, and of all those people who think that they will be going with him to the marriage feast, to the wedding supper of the Lamb. He will find some of them prepared, and he will find some of them unprepared at his coming. Isn't that exactly what we see? All of these virgins think they are in this wedding feast. Every one of them presumes that they will be entering with the groom to the celebration. And yet only half of them are truly prepared to do so. He will come and he will find some who claim to be his that are ready. And some who claim to be his who are not. And then fourthly, we're going to see, we see that those who are ready 
will join him and will enter with him into that glorious celebration. And those who are not ready will not. Jesus' policy when he returns is going to be really simple. If you're ready when I get there, you're coming. If you're one of those who's not ready, you'll be left outside. These are staggering truths. These are sobering things that Jesus is teaching in this parable. And the question that it leaves us with is, well then, Jesus, what in the world does it mean to be ready? What does it mean to be prepared? And the answer, I think we see the foundation of it at the end of this parable. And it's found in verse 11. It says, afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And now in verse 12, but he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. That is the beginning of the answer of what it means to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. You see, ultimately, what explained the fact that five of these bridesmaids were ready even for a delay and five of them were not is that those who were ready were known by the groom. They knew the groom. They had a relationship with the groom. As a result, they trusted the groom and they took steps that showed that they truly believed him when he said, I will meet you. I'm coming back tonight. The reason they were prepared, the foundation of it all, was a relationship. And the reason why the five didn't was because that relationship didn't exist. I do not know you. And it doesn't matter that how many times they call him Lord, like in Matthew 7. It doesn't even matter at that point what good things they did outside of a relationship with the groom. What mattered the first thing that mattered is that relationship. But having said that, I will also say that I do not think that that relationship with the groom is all that goes into or all that is contained in being prepared for him to return. Because what did they do as a result of that relationship? They did the job that he gave them to do. When he returned, he found them doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing while he was away. And we don't just see that idea of what it means to be prepared for Jesus to come again. Here in this parable, we see it in the parable before. We see it in the parable after. We see it in the conclusion. Look at just at the parable before this. Look at verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Very similar, a very similar truth being taught in this parable to the one that we saw in, in chapter 25. A master gives his servant a job and then goes away. And what does he, what does the faithful and wise servant do? How is he found when the master returns? Busy at work doing exactly what he was left to do. That's what it means in that parable to be prepared for Jesus to come again. Busy at work doing what God had called him to do. And what about the wicked servant that comes after? He's the one, verse 48, that says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants, eats and drinks with the drunkards. 
The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, don't get me wrong. There's a difference in the heart between the faithful servant and the wicked servant. There is a relationship with Christ that undergirds or that explains why the one is busy working for Christ in his absence, working for his master in his absence, and the other is not doing the things that he was left to do. The relationship is foundational, but the result of the relationship is faithful service in the absence of the master. And we see it in the parable that follows our parable as well, which we will not read. You know it well. We'll just sum it up. It's the parable of the talents. The master goes away once again. He leaves his servants, one with five talents, one with two talents, and one with one talent. And when he returns home, what does he find? And what does he commend? He finds that two out of those three servants had taken what he had left with them and used it for his good. They had been at work in his absence and one of them had not. The slothful servant, the wicked and slothful servant had not, was not doing anything with what was left for him in the absence of his master. That's what defines being prepared for the coming of Christ in all Three of these parables. And if we read the conclusion of this sermon, this Olivet Discourse as it's known as, verse 31 of our chapter, chapter 25, he says it in plain English without a parable. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal fire. And so if we ask ourselves, which every one of us must do when we read a passage like this, a parable like this, if we ask ourselves, am I? I, one of the five, am I one of the wise virgins who will be ready, who is ready for the return of our master, our king, the church's bridegroom? We must ask ourselves, not only do I have a relationship with him, but 
do I have a relationship with him that stirs me up to serve him while he is away? Do I have a relationship with him that leads me to obey him, to work for him in his absence, even when he's not around in the flesh? That is a saving relationship. That is the kind of relationship that will be acknowledged by Christ on that day. I will make it as clear as I possibly can to those of you who maybe don't know that this church teaches every week, week in and week out, the doctrines of of grace. That what this parable is not teaching is that you earn your way to heaven by being prepared for the master, for the bridegroom. What it is teaching is that when you know the bridegroom, when you know the bridegroom, you live a life of readiness for his appearance. That's what this parable is instructing us. And so that's what you've got to ask yourself. Am I living a life of readiness? Is that me? Do I have that saving relationship with the bridegroom that makes me live, that drives me to live for him? You could put it this way. It is those who are enlarging the kingdom of heaven on earth who will enter the kingdom of heaven when he comes. Is that you? And I know for so many of you, I see these wise bridesmaids, I see that in you. For so many of you, I have ministered alongside of you now for four and a half years. And thank God for the great work he has done in you and through you. And in me and through me is all grace. All grace. And what this parable ought to do for you is that it ought to encourage you It ought to encourage you with a reminder of that glorious day. That even though there's been a delay, for as long as you've been alive, the delay has been going on in your life. You are going to stand before Jesus face to face in the flesh. We need to remember this often. Remember it tonight. And be encouraged because what we want to hear, what we are living every day of our life to hear, is chapter 25, verse 23. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Those are the words that drive our lives Every single day. Those are the words that drive every single thing that we do in this life. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we work hard in our jobs? Why do we work hard in raising our families? Why do we work hard here at the church, serving the church? Why do we work hard getting the gospel out to those who are lost? It is for this very reason, because we believe that although there's been a delay, our Savior is returning. He could come at any moment, and when he comes, we want to be found busily at work, serving him faithfully doing the task that he has called each one of us individually to do, and we will look him in the eye, and he will be proud of us, and it will all be worth it. So worth it. A hundred times over. All the struggle will feel like, what did Paul say? Light momentary affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory of the commendation of our Savior. What did he say in Hebrews chapter 11? That that the way that God commended the saints of old, the world was not worthy of you. To hear him say that, 
when I stand before him, well done. The world was not worthy of you. Come. And then to enter into the joy of our master forever. We ought to be encouraged to do what, what 1 Corinthians 15 says, to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. But if you're sitting here tonight and you have to say that although maybe you've claimed to have a relationship with the Lord, if you're honest with yourself, you do not live a life of readiness for his coming. You don't even think about his coming. You're not living in anticipation of and preparation for that day. If you have to be honest with yourself, you're living for yourself. To get ahead in this world. What a wake-up call this is for you. What a warning God is graciously sending your way this evening. Wake up. Don't be deceived by the mockers who say 2,000 years of any day now. I'm coming like a thief in the night. And at that moment, your association with those who are prepared, it's not going to save you. Did you notice how they went to the wise virgins and asked for oil? They thought that they could ride the readiness of the wise bridesmaids into the wedding feast. And God says, no, no. There's no admittance by association. It doesn't matter who you know. It doesn't matter if your parents are ready for Jesus to come back. It doesn't matter if your pastor is ready for Jesus to come back. It doesn't matter if your spouse is ready for Jesus to come back. It's on an individual basis. And don't be deceived into thinking that there's going to be some kind of last-minute preparation. Isn't that what they tried to do after they couldn't steal from the wise virgins? Didn't they try and go buy oil? How many are deceiving themselves, comforting themselves, thinking, I can, be, I can live for myself now. And in the last moment, before he comes again, or before I die, I can get right with God. There's always later. Was there a later for the foolish virgins? No exceptions. No last minute preparation. And no late admittance. Once the doors are closed... Through, judge, through the second coming or through death, there's no second chance. What an opportunity you have right now that you may never get again. There's only one way, and it begins and ends with Jesus Christ. Do you know the bridegroom? Oh, he will change your life. But you can't. Go to the bridegroom. Go to the one who exemplified exactly what we're talking about tonight. Who exemplified perfect service to his father while he was on the earth because you couldn't. The one who was perfectly, perfectly prepared to obey his father every step of the way and who died on the cross because we weren't for our disobedience, a substitutionary death and who offers you that substitution tonight, who offers you his life a perfect obedience for your life of selfishness and sin. Who says, you will receive my righteousness and I will receive your sins upon myself 
and deal with them permanently. That is an offer far too good to refuse. Tonight's your wake-up call. Don't hit the snooze. Don't pass it by. You may not get another chance. There are few things that Satan wants more than for us to get so caught up in this life that we forget where it's headed. Because you know what? It's in anticipation of, in preparation for our glorious future that we are enabled to live gloriously for God in the present. And so may God use this parable to wake us all up, remind us all. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask you that you would use the warning of your son, the parable and the words of your son that he spoke 2,000 years ago and that you would speak those words afresh in the heart of anyone here tonight who is thinks they may know the bridegroom perhaps before this, but realizes that they are totally unprepared for his coming. Lord, the Holy Spirit can speak those words again within and convict and save. Lord, I pray that they would trust in your Son for life. And I pray for every one of us who already knows you, Lord, who are, who are striving to do the work that you have called us to do in your absence, to make disciples of all nations, to love and serve one another in the individual way that you have gifted and called us, each of us. I pray that we would be filled with joy at the thought that you could come at any moment and that we would be filled with eagerness to be found faithful on that glorious day. We ask that you would make Founders Baptist Church more and more and more into a church that exemplifies the kind of readiness and faithful service that you delight to see when you come again. Do that good work in us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.